So no, please take it away. Yeah. This is, uh, I'm just going to do a disclaimer right now. This is probably going to be the weirdest workshop I've probably ever done in my life. I have no idea how it's going to turn out. And I also have no idea who's following along at home. So if you are following along, let me know in the chat. If you also are following, put your video on. I'd love to see you making things, doing things, and yeah, just being hands-on. I'm just gonna turn my music down slightly. Uh, my, there we go, awesome. So, hi, for those of you that don't know me, I am Chanel Vestergaard, also known as Nell Little Pink Maker. Um, I run a, oh, what, girl, what do I do these days? I run a creative space here in Copenhagen where I, Teach people skills, you make a friend and you get hands on. Basically, they're the three things that I do. And I just took over a school. Um, <laughs> I say took over, I'm currently in 200 square meters. So I just built this lab that you see around me, which is a creative space. And then to the door just over there is our new bio lab. And I'm currently building and um, still building. So you're here today for Material X. If you know about me, you know about Material X. If you don't, Material X is basically a biomaterial education kit that has 10 recipes, 10 samples, and lots of other fun, cool things that you can do with it. We did a Kickstarter, and then we realized that, hmm, maybe this wasn't the best idea to do a Kickstarter just yet. Why? Because I have over 160 recipes that I've been developing over the past three and a half years, and I wanted to put more into it. I really wanted to push a lot more out but also I wanted to learn a lot more too. So I've been redoing a lot of things and just basically taking my time to figure out biomaterials. What is a biomaterial? When we talk about biomaterials, what constitutes in our mind a biomaterial should be? So in the chat box, what I want you guys to do is to tell me what you think a biomaterial is and what you think a biomaterial shouldn't be. So I'm gonna give you a few minutes just to write in the chat box and um, see what you guys actually think a biomaterial is. Yep, biodegradable, friendly to nature. It should be biodegradable, yep. Biodegradable is an interesting word. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. It should be obtained and produced by natural sources, yep. Not only made from biological sources, but regenerative and biodegradable. Yes, regenerative, regenerative is a great word. It's a really great word. Made from biological processes. Uh, yes and no, it can depend. A biomaterial is any material made by a biological process. That is also true and not true. A biomaterial is renewable, biodegradable and genuinely safe. Genuinely safe. I like that. I like that. Genuinely, hmm, definitely a questionable thing in my book. Um, so I'm going to give you a few more minutes to write what you think a biomaterial is. What do you think a biomaterial isn't? That's more of an interesting one. What do you think a biomaterial isn't? Because we have a lot of talk and greenwashing, especially in um, society at the moment, as to what a biomaterial is. Yeah, NIH is an interesting resource to follow. Um, I'm here in Denmark and um, we are classed as one of the green capitals of the world, or so they call themselves, and it's all horse crap. It's, <laughs> it's not. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that as I do some of my prepping and cooking to show you. Medical applications, not necessarily, not necessarily. They shouldn't be just for medical because there's so many more things out there in the world that we need biomaterials for. Okay, okay, awesome. So biomaterials, we have this terminology of biodegradable and biocompostable. Now, if you know what biodegradable actually means, give me a little kind of high reaction and if you know what biocompostable I think I said that one but if you know what biodegradable is say hi if you know what biocompostable actually means give me a little clapping emoji 
The reason I say that is because biodegradable does not mean biocompostable. They are two completely different things. Now, as defined by the UN, anything that is biodegradable is still a microplastic. Shock horror. I found this out two years ago, and I was at a conference here in Copenhagen, and I was like, oh, but my 3D prints are plastic. It's all biodegradable. And then the guy who was at um, <laughs> United Nations turned around and went, hmm, I actually don't think that's right. I said, no, but it is. It really is. Uh, no, it's still a microplastic. Here's the research. So the research was given to me and um, yeah, I got school that day. Definitely got school. Basically what happens is as it breaks down, it becomes a microplastic. So it becomes 0.2 microns, which is the overall consensus for what a particle of microplastic is. Now, PLA, polylactic acid, as we know, poly is a compound, lactic acid is what makes up the compound together to make it form into a plastic. PLA is used in 3D printers um, behind just here. I have a Arduino Material 101. I have a Prusa MK3 Multi Ultimaker 2, and then I also have a Formlabs 1 resin. Now, the resin is not bio in any sense or form and never will be, but the PLA isn't also. So when we get into this talk of compostability, biodegradability, nothing is truly as it says. Now, if you come across a material and it says that it's completely biocompostable, now you're talking because that means that it breaks down again and goes back into a system where it can benefit something else. So what I'm going to show you today is two recipes that are completely biocompostable, made from basic things such as agar. This is just normal store agar from my local Chinese grocery really nice and fine and i have a material system so i have in total about 700 of these kind of containers and they're all labeled for this reason and numbered because it goes into a chart that i have we're also going to use some of this i don't know if you guys have heard of this is exanthan gum and it's also used as a binder in a lot of foods it's the same principle as agar. Um, some places it's easier to get hold of. It's a fine white powder. Do you know any biodegradable material you can be used for surgical masks? That is actually a really good question. And you might want to go to the guys over at um, Nation of Makers. They actually have a great um, Facebook page where we've been talking about this for a while now. Um, I'm making masks at the moment out of potato plastic. <laughs> um, they are not to be used officially, but more of a um, conceptualization of where could materials go if we had other purposes or other things. Um, but they're not, they're not for Corona. Yes, I can. I will put it into the workshop Slack um, when I get around to it. And one of the other things I'm going to use, so if you read through the workshop description, you'll see I mentioned gelatine. Unfortunately, I can't find my gelatine um, container because I just moved. So what I'm going to use is I'm going to use methyl cellulose, which is, um, again, it's a cellulose binder used a lot in things like water marbling and for making apple leather, which is also one of the things that I do. And we're going to use some of this stuff, which is, um, again, a powder. So it's an indigo powder. I'm just going to dip my finger. I really shouldn't have done that, but hey ho. It is a pure indigo. It is so dark and it's fantastic for coloring materials because it's easy to see when there's a color. And we're going to use some glycerine. Uh, so the glycerine I use comes from a vegetable glycerine. You can get sugar based glycerine. Um, mine is again off Amazon, really easy to get everything I have. You can find on Amazon and if anyone wants like a BOM of the 10 materials in the Material X collection, please do just message me. I'm more than happy to share them. I'll be putting out some resources really soon once I'm settled here at the school for people to learn and use and teach with too. But for now, this is what we're gonna do with. So we're using glycerin and we're also using some trusty H2O. Nothing more, nothing less. 
just pure water out of the tap. Uh, here in Copenhagen, I will say our water contains um, on average, I think it's like 32% more kelp than most European countries. So it doesn't really matter what water you use. Um, I do try and filter my water when I can, but for this purpose, I'm not going to. So what we're going to do first off is I'm going to show you how to make a very, very simple seaweed plastic. Now there's recipes on the internet that you can go and take. Um, there's recipes on different sites that do biomaterials too. This one is one that I developed. It was, after the, it was actually the first thing I learned from Bio Academy. So I did Biohack Academy, uh, which is based at Vag Society in the Netherlands. And that's kind of how I got into DIY Bio. I'm a textile designer by trade. Don't really have uh, much else besides that, to be honest. And now I'm kind of doing this. So this recipe is called, um, so it's 004 of the Material X collection, and it's called agar plastic. It's really that simple. So to start with, what we're going to do, is we're going to take a pan, and I just have a hotbed induction plate for my Kia. I'm just going to turn it on. It does make a weird beeping noise, so don't be worried it's your fire alarm or something. There we go. So this is this is really good. I'm actually gonna move the camera down so you guys can see a bit better. There we go. So yeah, this is a different pan. Yeah, this one's probably the better one. There we go. So what I first like to do is I like to just warm the pan up slightly. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna put in our water. I told you this is the way this workshop. Usually you guys are with me and you do this and then you make your own recipes at the same time. So what we're going to do is we're going to do 60 milliliters of water. And that's a little bit too more. It's fine, oh, that's great. So 60 milliliters of water. And it might not seem like a lot, but it's just to get your agar powder to disperse. Yes, yeah, so the mycelium mask is uh, is interesting because I'll talk about that in a second when we get to mycelium. I have some next to me. What you're going to use is a small spoon, so just a normal teaspoon, and it's just leveled slightly. And you just want to put that in before it starts kind of boiling up. Take a spoon and just disperse it into the pan. You want to try and make sure that you don't get a lot of lumps so you move fast. And it will smell strange. I'm kind of used to it. I fertilize all my plants with fish poop. So to me, this fish smell is not too bad. And then what you end up with is, if I can turn the pan actually, let's see if I can, so that you guys can see this. You'll end up with like this, um, there we go. You want this like kind of brownish liquid and it doesn't have any lumps in it, any bumps, this kind of the consistency you're going for. And you can see this is only a tiny amount. Usually I make for a really, really big like Ikea box but I'm only going to do like a dinner plate size one. So it's just going to boil again slightly. Turn it down. And then I go in and I add another 60 of water. And then I just stir it again. And this just helps to make sure that nothing has, again, stuck to the sides. People ask me all the time, why don't you just put 120 in straight away? I've done that and I found I always end up with really horrible lumpy bits. So just splitting it up, make sure that you get a nice even material. And it's a lot more fun to work with. Okay, awesome. So then all we're gonna do is we're just gonna go in with roughly, 20 milliliters of our glycerine. Sorry. 
20. I don't think the camera focused then, but we'll see. And we're just going to add in some pigment, which is a dash. And then we just want to stir it. And now it'll start to smell really strange. So basically what's happening is the indigo has its own natural um, chemical makeup that reacts with the glycerine and now it smells like horse poop. Really gross. And then what you want to do is you want to let it go to a boil. So imagine you're making like a candy. If you've ever made candy at home, you'll notice you get like a sugar syrup boil where it boils really intensely and really rapidly. That's what you're going for. So I usually, when I start to see the boil happen, I'll start to count to 20, really slow. So I'm just gonna move. Oh, that was a good idea, but okay. So you see that this kind of brown scum, let me try and move it back a bit, actually, there we go. So this stage right now, where it's kind of bubbling, puffing up, puffing down, that's what you want. Okay, so now I'm gonna count to 20. So, <laughs> thank you, Patrick, I know, this is so weird. I said this is gonna be the weirdest workshop ever. So, one, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. So the consistency you want is still pretty liquid. It's not really viscous as such. And you just want to move it around so you'll see that the indigo in places hasn't really dispersed so it's not like it's completely dissolved into the liquid and that's perfectly fine because as it starts to dry it actually merges back in as you'll see in a second so i'm just gonna put you guys back here my my glasses all fogged up so we're just gonna go back in and i'm just gonna work the mixture And the great thing about this is it is completely biocompostable. So because you've used the sugar that comes from a vegetable source, rather than say PLA uh, corn as such. Yeah, everything's natural. Everything is completely natural. So I grow all my own pigments here in Copenhagen. Um, I make all my own pigments as well. So I go on rock hunts and yeah, I, do a lot of natural bits work. So at this stage, you want to turn your heat off. It will still be really kind of, I think you can see that really that much, but it's really bubbly. So what you're going to do is you're going to take a cold surface. Yes, so that's indigo flower, yes. And if anyone wants any seeds of this, um, pop me an email and I'll be more than happy to send you some seeds because I have lots of them. So once you have your liquid, cold surface, and you just want to pour it out and I pour it from a height so if I'm pouring low you tend to get these really small air bubbles which is great if you want a texture not so great if you uh if you don't so it'll look like I'm gonna move my camera again it'll look like this And it'll start to set really quick. So I'm just going to move you guys again. Oh, one hand. Yeah, actually, I can show you guys something really cool in a second um, that I did for the Material X project. So I'm going to let that settle for a second, and I'm going to grab my fiber bag. So hang on, I'm going to go in the lab.
So as many of you know, I worked with a company in Canada to create a pair of pineapple shoes. And part of that process was me testing different materials. So this is not the best way to store materials, by the way, but I've been moving, so this is all I have. So I've been making these really cool materials. I'm gonna talk about them in a second, just gonna get them out. And they are classed as natural biomaterials uh, because of how they are composed. So we'll start off with the one that I find is a little bit, not that weird, but it's still weird to some people. So this is banana. All of this is what I've been making since I last a summit. <laughs> so, uh, as most people know, there's literally, I mean, a whole, keep going, keep going. I mean, there's literally four and a half meters of this stuff. And how I make it into something else is by drop spinning. So if you're aware of traditional Viking reenactments, especially here in Denmark, uh, how many bananas is that worth? Hang on, I'll get my banana plant and show you. So, <laughs> say hello to Fred. This is Fred, and he is my beautiful banana friend, and he is what gives me <laughs> my banana fiber. So, Fred, I'm sorry, this is for science. As I say, it's gonna get weird. Yeah, real Danish bananas, who would ever thought? They're, and, it's, and it's technically a GMO, but don't tell the government. You can't do GMOs in Denmark, well, unless you're in a facility. So, I have my banana and if I pull the stem, you'll see these tiny fibers. And that is literally what I do is I take all of these tiny fibers. <laughs> I know, poor Fred. So what I do is I take all these tiny fibers. So it usually takes me on average about three weeks to make a kilo of fabric. I've had help, so don't worry. And also I reached out to some gardening guys in Belgium who have banana plants that they sell to normal general public. And they gave me all of their banana dead off cuts because what happens is the banana yellows over time. So it goes like this horrible texture and color because it's dying, it's dead material that I can use to turn into other things. So what you do is you separate the strands of the banana and again I used to use a toothbrush to do this I'm not the most sciencey in any shape or form you may see what you have but if I just hold that up to the camera all of these tiny small threads you can't really see them that well actually but all of these threads that are kind of hanging off the banana that is what makes all my banana fabric. So the protocol for that will be on my website, fingers crossed, end of October, fingers crossed. But that's what happens. Then what you do is you soak the um, fibers in calcium chloride. And then what you do is called the wet spinning process. So wet spinning involves basically a salad spinner. You stick it in calcium chloride, sodium lactate, we both know the chemical reaction of what happens to that. It forms a coating and then you're able to strip literally the fibers together and you end up with this. And it's super soft because what happens is afterwards you take it and dump it in some cold water, get a carder, and you start to card it like you would with wool. And then to make it into actual thread, let me show you this. I actually have the bag next to me now. 
And um, tell me how, yes, so this is completely biocompostable. This isn't biodegradable, this is biocompostable. So, how do you get it from being a fiber, long fiber, into thread? Now, this is where <laughs> my husband thinks I'm really weird. Let's go and do Viking reenactment LARPs for fun on a weekend. Why would I want to do that? Because I need to learn how to spin. So what you would do is you would stick your, I'll do a demonstration with my pineapple one in a minute. But this is, this one is pineapple, no? No, it's pineapple. So this is pineapple. And basically what you do is you stick it on your fiber on the top and then you would do this. And then as you spin, the tension involved, which means spinning and pulling, creates a thread. And if I just do this, it is, you can see like my fingers trussed up like a pig. It's really strong. And this is a natural material we have in abundance in certain parts of the world. So it got me thinking, what else is there out there that we could use? And um, I mean, I have bags of research. Dane, Danes, <laughs> yeah, I could do a strength test. Danes love roses. So this started on Valentine's Day. Danes love mojitos. So this is mint. And I'll, uh, I'll go through them all. And if anyone does want samples, again, please do message me so I can send you them. I've uh, just have a check in on our bioplastic. This is the test. Like, it's uh, pretty nice. It's not a bad test. Uh, question, is it easy to find? <laughs> is it easy to find by the chemicals? Yes, it is. It's really, really simple. You can get the chemicals on Amazon. I am a DIY bioist because I do not have access to chemicals, reagents, plasmids, you name it. I don't have it. I'm not from academia. You know, people in academia shun their nose upon me because what I'm doing apparently is the wrong way to do education. And I should go and do a degree as a teacher and then come back. It's really weird, but that's a different talk for a different day. With all the plants you're turning into fibers, how do you decide to determine they were viable? Every plant contains cellulose. Think about this. If all of our textiles, and I mentioned I'm a textile designer by trade, if all of our textiles are made out of cellulose, why can we not turn every plant into cellulose fibers? Why can we not then spin the cellulose fiber? Why can we not then weave the cellulose fiber? Why can we not make huge tapestries like we did in the 1800s from cellulose fiber? So that's kind of where my research starts and finishes. It is very smooth. So you'll see, excuse me, my camera slightly. So it's very smooth, really. And I'm just gonna to start to peel it because now it's cool. You wanna make sure. So this plastic, the seaweed plastic is not waterproof, but can you imagine having candies? It's Halloween. So imagine having candies in a completely edible wrapper. Cause this is, you can eat this. If it didn't have the pigment in it, you could eat the pigment, but I wouldn't advise it. It doesn't taste nice. But technically you could eat this. So you can make a candy, you know, stick it in the middle, wrap it. I'm just gonna pull it up from the plate. Ta -da! So yeah, here we go. So this is seaweed plastic. It is so cool. And you saw how quick and easy that was. Now this is completely, I mean, like, Baldy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it back on the plate and we're going to come back. I'm actually going to post this in the workshop group. Does it crease? Yes, it can crease and bend. So let's see, for example, here, kind of. Um, I'm going to keep this on the plate. So I'm going to dehydrate it and post pictures in the workshop channel. So come Sunday, it will be completely dehydrated. So it'll have a completely different tense. Um, texture again. How do you spin the threads from the banana? So <laughs> I'm going to show you that in a second while the other material is set.
setting because we have two materials to do. I'm a little bit conscious of time. So, who does a quick rinse and come back? Okay, so I just move all the plastic out of the way so we don't fire to the school. Careful for not putting jars on lids. So what we're going to do next is we're going to do a methyl cellulose agar base. So methyl cellulose again is just cellulose. It's used in marbling, especially Turkish marbling. It's this white powder, really easy to work with. If you add this into pectin and chitosan, you can make a plastic from prawns. And again, I have that recipe on my website. So with this one, we're going to do one tablespoon. A half and for this one you don't put the water in first you start with the powder and then what we're going to do is we're going to pour in a hundred milliliters of water so just another and a mile glass and just pour that in and then you want to do a cold dissolve so you don't want any heat this time around because you want it to just basically create this texture, this like slimy, thick paste. And at first it looks like toothpaste gone wrong. It's really gross. And it smells like wallpaper paste. Now you can substitute this for wallpaper paste, but I wouldn't recommend it because wallpaper paste goes moldy really fast, uh, especially if it's left like this. And there it goes. So what you're looking for is this weird texture. Yes, so you can find me at um, littlepinkmaker.com. My website is currently kind of having an overhaul and because I've also been an organizer, there's not a lot on there at the moment besides all my workshops and classes that I do in Copenhagen. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna add some heat. I'm just gonna put the heat back on. So now you just want to heat it until it starts to dissolve fully. So you've got this really kind of, let's pick up a, a chunk, this really weird, like white textury material. And it's really strange because at first you're like, oh, what is this? Is this going to work? It does, trust me. So as someone was asking before, how do you spin fibers? So let's talk about, for example, let's do mint. While it's heating up. So, as I mentioned, plants, <laughs> plants have cellulose. This is mint. So this is taken from the stem of the plant. Yeah, that's mint right there. And again, I have a whole roll of the stuff. So, how do you get it from being this into a fiber? It's called drop spinning. And if people want one of these, these are made in Denmark by a LARP friend of mine. Again, I'm more than happy to do a small box to send out to people. I used to have um, an actual kit on my Patreon a while back, but I um, don't really do Patreon these days. Don't have time for it. So I'm just gonna keep this here. Let's stir this a second before it starts to get funky on me again. If you add methyl cellulose to aquafaba, you can actually make a foam. And that's what I've been working on with a designer in Copenhagen. So I'm just going to add in another 100 milliliters of water. Now it's warm. So 100 milliliters. I'm just going to boil this on a five. So spinning. Let's take a section of fabric. So boiling, I'm just gonna stop boiling. So I'm just gonna take this away. And this is why I said it'd be so much better if this was in person. Because then I could actually let you guys spin. I'm gonna take this much. How you start is grab a section, wrap it around the hook, 
and I have added fibres before into some of my recipes. And then what you do, the fibres hook on the top here, and then you start pulling until you get this. And then what you do is under one arm, you have this long fibre, you can't really see because of the, the boiling right now. Multitasking. Wouldn't be doing this if we were actually all together, but hey ho. So what you do is one hand, you have the thread, you do what's called shaft and pull. So you pull down, you pull down, you pull down, and you use your fingers to pinch at the same time to create the same size thread, and then you drop spin. So again, I go in a anti-clockwise motion. And you can see I'm making thread really, really simple. And again, shaft and pull. Now you can also use a um, spinning wheel to do this as well. It's really simple. And to get the mint textile, I did the same process again. It's just calcium lactate, um, sodium chloride, and then some basic bleach to clean it. So what will happen sometimes is it's drafted. So you'll see it's coming done and I have the rest in my hand. You just want to piece it together, hold and pull, and just move it forwards and backwards till it reconnects. And this is getting pretty dissolved. So I'm happy about that. I'm just gonna move this piece out of the way. I just wanna pull and pull, draft pull, and then just spin again. So you can see the principle and the concept. You just spin and pull, spin and pull, until you get, I'm gonna do it over here where you can see slightly, until you get thread and then it can come off. I'll actually show you here, for example. So then there's, and this is how it starts. So you have to do this at least seven or eight times to get it nice, like my first ones. But again, if people want to learn this, please do reach out. I do do online classes and send kits. So I'm more than happy to teach. Okay, so this is coming to the boil. And now for this one, I'm just going to add in some natural plants, you could say. The thread for that's actually a really good, really, really good one. So I'm just going to add in some plants. So I make a lot of all my herbal mixtures as well. So I do a lot of foraging. Um, I used to do some work for Noma a while back. And also it helps with the smell too, which is super nice. It's going to really get intense with the bubbling. And I'm just going to add in some more Methyl cellulose. So that is three spoons of methyl cellulose now. And you just want to dissolve it. So this one does have a lot of texture to it because of the methyl cellulose, and that's nice because. Sometimes you do want texture. You can pour this into molds and other kinds of things too. But um, I, I just like to do my vacuum form and I make shapes and then I vacuum form the plastic sometimes depending on the tensile strength and the heat properties. So once you've done that, you want to go back in again with the last 20 milliliters of glycerine. And I have recipes where I use eggshell, I have recipes where I use orange peels, apple peels to make leather, kombucha like most people do, um, coconut amino acids, coconut waste, um, discarded cotton textiles. So, okay, so, and again, I'm just gonna show you what it looks like from, my um, POV. So you see these white lumps? That's your methyl cellulose. 
And that's perfectly fine because for this material, you do want it to have this kind of bubbling process. What's the difference between agar and methyl cellulose? Well, agar is a uh, more of a thicker material. It also doesn't have the same mechanical properties as methyl cellulose. Methyl cellulose is just basically pure cellulose. Okay, so I'm going to turn this off. And um, we've got another clean plate, cold plate. I'm just going to do a pour. You can take the other handle. And this isn't going to be the prettiest of materials, I have to say, but that's my own personal choice because, oh yeah, I like different weird things. I'm just going to spread it out. It looks like someone's puked on a plate. It really is not the most aesthetically pleasing material, but um, I definitely done worse. So I'm just going to show you again. This is what it looks like. Oh no, where are we? There we go. This is what it looks like. It looks gross. I know it looks revolting, but it'll start to set really quick. So we've got a few more minutes while we let this set. Um, I'm going to take some questions. So. Drop a question in the chat. I'm just going to drop this in the kitchen. And I'll wash it when I'm done. There we go. Super. I'm aware that we don't have a lot of time but yeah I have so many materials it's crazy this is soya bean so again this is soya fabric so we have taken the soya beans we've made soy milk the leftover fiber is basically this so you can imagine a jacket you know or a pillow for example that's made completely stuffed with this kind of material and this is biocompostable this is a fiber that can break down. It can also be used for animal bedding as well, which is super nice. Um, this is Rami. Yeah, you can use it for the walls of your homes too. Um, I grow the soya with mycelium. So Rami is just a cotton form. And it's just, again, it's really nice material to work with. So I grow a lot of really weird stuff. I also have a lot of variegated plants too, the genetics in them, but that's a different topic for a different day. This is flax or linen as we know it. And this is what linen looks like before you get it woven into your textiles. It's a really great material to work with. And it's really, really tough. I mean, it's really, really nice to work with. Um, I add this into my kombucha like someone was asking earlier on because it really does give it the extra strength properties to make it well a really nice material to use uh, what else do i have rose rami so like i said these are roses and this was done well this was started on valentine's so again it's got this weird property uh yes so to waterproof kombucha you need to use amino acids from oranges so the skin of the orange you need to use uh, to make it waterproof and that was developed with the help of a friend of mine um, from DTU and um, yeah it was a super super cool project to do actually uh, but again DTU won't let me in to be a student so I had to go the back way. This is slowly setting. It's not the most aesthetically pleasing. I'm just going to rub my screen a second. Let me, there we go. There we go. Sorry, Ugh, this looks so gross. But it is setting very slowly. It's very, very warm still. Um, no, so you actually extract the amino acids from oranges, from the orange peels. And then you basically make a coating you put on top of the SCOBY. And then you let it dry. Um, I've tried everything from beeswax, coconut oil, lanolin, floor varnish. I've tried all kinds. And Patrick also. Patrick is also known as the granddaddy of the kombucha world. <laughs> I 
his stuff. Um, yeah, I've done a lot of things by material wise and it's, it's really, really tricky. But if you have kombucha questions, you should really ask Patrick. He also was part of the kombucha genomic project, which was super, super cool. We used to have a lab a long time ago now um, where we were part of that project, but here I am doing something different. So the other thing I want to mention is mycelium. There's going to be a workshop on mycelium by someone else, but this is a strain that I got from one of the guys at Boss Labs last year um, at bio, when we did the Biosummit Strain Exchange. And basically all I've grew it out on is, don't breathe, is coffee grounds. And it's super cool because, try not to breathe into it, contamination is not your friend. Um, it's really cool because once you have a starter like this, you can basically get a whole community into biomaterials. So I make shapes on my Ultimaker printer. I then vacuum form it. So we basically make, we make plant pots. We vacuum form the shape. We then get people from the community in and we start teaching them about DIY bio by making mycelium based plant pots. Everybody right now is in this plant craze. Everyone wants to have nature in their homes. But also by doing this, we use a waste stream. We then also, do a, um, a class on science, which is super cool, and also make a biomaterial at the same time. If people want, I have um, 15 different strains of mycelium. If people also want copies of the strains making on stabs, also please message me. Um, I'm going to be doing some agar work at the end of the month, so I'm happy to ship out strains. I can send them cross borders. Um, I'm based here in Denmark, like I mentioned. I can send them worldwide. I just need a secure address that I know you're going to pick up from. But yeah, pretty much that's it. So let's just double check this one. It's a little bit slimy still. So in some places it's, it's set. You can kind of see this. Um, I have some kombucha spun fiber material in Finland right now um, at the BioArt Society with Eric and the gang. Um, I can't get my box back because I left it there before Corona, but I can grab some of my research papers or research pieces, I should say, for my Google Doc and ping you on Slack. So we've got a few more minutes left. I'm not sure it's going to set in time, but I'll post pictures and maybe a small video into Slack. If you have any questions, please do ask now. Also, feel free to turn your mics on and ask me too. Um, it's a bit lonely being behind this side of the screen. Usually I have you guys all around me making materials. So um, if you do have a question, please ask, because I guess we're going to finish pretty soon. Let me get the other sample. Not a problem at all. I mean, this is this one's so cool. I love, I love making agar plastic because you can do this with children and it's really in effect, well, really effective. It's like a jellyfish. I mean, and then it's also, it's got this great, I just put this to the camera, like, you see these kind of bubbly bits. It's super, super cool, super cool. But anyhow, uh, what do I use to dry it? Um, it really depends. I dry it in various ways. I have a dehydrator. I have an oven. Um, I also have a solar blaster. I have a humidity chamber made out of a suitcase. <laughs> I have a lot of things that so really depends on the material, what texture I'm trying to get and what kind of properties I want as well and what my final product is meant to be. How can you make the agar and plastic waterproof? Uh, the thing is, do I really want them waterproof? You have to ask this, are we designing for a purpose or are we designing for the future? If we're designing for a purpose, then it needs to be waterproof. But if we're designing for the future, shouldn't this be one-time use that can go into the soil, decompose, and that's it? I mean, isn't that the ultimate goal of what we want for materials, to be completely circular? Yeah, I, I'd love to see clothing made out of this kind of stuff too, but to be honest, I would love to see clothing made out of better things. 
I mean, this is concept that I designed. Are we designing for disaster or are we designing the disaster? I mean, are we designing for here and now being the disaster that we've caused as humans over the years? Or are we designing for the disaster that's coming ahead in the next 50, 60 years? So I question that when I make a lot of my own textiles and my own plastics, because I want to know what is my purpose and how can I make sure that my purpose is fulfilled, but also my role with the materials fulfills that purpose. Can you make 3D printing filaments? Yes, you can. You can make clay out of eggs. Um, the eggshell plastic, you can actually 3D print like a clay ceramic printer. You can then inject mycelium into said clay and grow pots <laughs> and other things made out of clay with mycelium. Um, I've done a printer made out of, what did we use? It was like a soil mud. It was really weird, uh, but it had reindeer pooping. That's also another project. I'm going to be working with some guys at MIT at, at, on. Um, I did plant waste into 3D printer filament. Yeah, PLA is really wasteful. I mean, I've got a whole box of stuff. I teach children, well, I have, will teach children some really cool stuff um, here at the school once I'm set up. But in general, I've taught children from ages four to, you know, 16, and they always do things wrong with the 3D printer. It's just guaranteed. So you always have waste, and waste is a design flaw. So how do we fix that? It's a really, really hard topic. Okay, so a few more questions, because I believe we need to wrap up. And again, if you have any questions, you can find me on Slack. I am now Little Pink. Uh, you can find me also on littlepinkmaker.com, Instagram, LinkedIn, all the usual social media channels. I'm there. Um, I do a lot of really, really strange stuff sometimes. Oh no, I have 20 minutes. All right, perfect. I, f I really thought I was finishing like with an hour. I didn't realize that. You, know, you have until 4.15 now. Please answer more questions, enlighten us. You're saying, you're saying words that are changing. How are you thinking too? So please give us more of that, like words of wisdom. I love it. I wouldn't even say it's wisdom. It's literal 3 a.m. thinkings of what is my life? How can I make this material happen? Where can I buy the stuff? My husband hates me because he'll find me at 4 a.m. on my phone, browsing different things, trying to buy different things. And um, yeah, go to sleep. In just two more minutes, I need to buy this. Um, so how hard can you get this plastic to be? Really hard. So I've actually made a ball. Um, so it was 10 centimeters in diameter, around four millimeters in thickness out of the plastic. We made a mold and basically like an ice cube mold. And I dropped it from the fourth floor <laughs> of my apartment. Now my, my apartment's pretty high up. I'm just gonna say that. And um, it fell to the bottom and it was still in one piece. And that kind of shocked me. And I did the same test using the milk plastic that I make. So to make milk plastic, you just need milk and vinegar and a pan. And that milk plastic recipe was developed in the 1600s and was used to make the first ball game dice. So they used cochineal bugs ground up to make pigments, natural pigments. Um, that's what's found, you know, red carmine and so on. Again, that's another bug, but cochineal and carmine are reds in varieties. So what they do is they grind it up, they make the little milk plastic dices, they then dab in the dice sides, let it set, and they will put dices. Um, it's really strong. And I'm hoping, fingers crossed, or wanting to, fingers crossed, do some research testing on the strims. So if anybody wants to collaborate with me on that, maybe you have the facilities to help me do this kind of work, please do let me know. I'd be more than happy to work with you, send you some samples, do some really cool stuff because I want to get this tested professionally. I mean, I'm not a scientist. I am 100% DIY bio. <laughs> I can't say it any kind of other way. I'm not a scientist and people think I am. And what I do is probably some kind of weird magic science, but I'm not. Um, are there some ways to recycle and use PLA? Yes, there are. So what you can do is you can get yourself a heat press um, <laughs> Go on to Amazon, AliExpress, whatever is your local kind of cheap vendor for things. Get yourself a heat press, get yourself two baking parchment sheets, put your PLA in between the parchment sheets. Heat press, pull it down, count to 30, that's what I do, and you end up with sheets that you can then laser cut. 
So you can actually laser cut PLA sheets and make um, jewelry or models. So that's what I'm doing with all my leftover stuff as I'm melting it into sheets, making Christmas decorations and then donating them to a local hospital here in Copenhagen for their Christmas tree because waste is a design flaw. Um, is the actual material a thermoplastic? It's not exactly a thermoplastic, I wouldn't say that. It's more of a cold composite that you can extrude through a, a nozzle of some kind. So it could be a, um, a needle, you know, that you have, you know, syringe needle system. It could be a 3D printer. You can adapt your most household 3D printers. I know my automaker can be adapted into a clay printer because that's what I do. But you can adapt most printers with a cold nozzle system. So you can actually print the, 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 the plastic, basically, or the material. Have you tried using these PLA sheets in your plastic? Yes, I have. So my vacuum forming machine, hang on, let me grab it. It's pretty cool. Sorry, things have crossed the studio. So this is <laughs> my vacuum form machine. It is tabletop. It's really, really nice to use. It's called the Mayaku form box. And if you reach out to these guys and you say what you're doing, they'll probably send you one for free. <laughs> That's how I got this bad boy. Um, roughly they're about six, maybe $700 to buy. But if you tell them your project and that you work in a community setting, I'm going to say six pounds out of 10, they'll send you one for free. This place up here is where the heat is. These are casting sheets. So you can see the kind of size that you work with. Uh, and they come in also these kind of sheets too. But this is basically the size that you'd need for vacuum forming your PLA sheets and the thinness that you need to get them to. And then what happens is you stick it into the top system. Let me get it. You get it through. It goes up here like this. It will then bend and warp, and then you can then obviously vacuum form things. Uh, this is called the Maiku M A K Y U. If you contact those guys, just say, "Hey, you saw Little Pink's machine. If you want to know more?" I'm pretty sure they'd be happy to reach out and tell you about this. You can put this back. We've got no space. I thought I had a question from Alex. Um, Alex, the seaweed plastic is actually really strong. I can show you next time you're at the school. I can show you next time we're at the school. But it's, it's great because you can actually, again, you can make so many things with this plastic. And again, depending on how you uh, pour it, you can get different thicknesses, different things. It's really, really cool. And again, you can make so much with it. I'm just wondering if this one is set. Okay, so this is kind of set a little, it's still a bit warm. I'm just gonna try and do a skim. Praying to the material gods. Okay, yeah, I can do a skim. It's a little bit soft in places, which means that it hasn't fully set, but I can do the skim. So let's see. Exactly, it's a Maiku. They're super cool guys. Or maybe actually you might hold. So yeah, you can see, you know, instead of having a resin, if you work as an artist and you capture things with resin, you can actually do it this way because you get these beautiful bits. It's a bit soft in some places still, but you can actually get these beautiful, you can see this, sheets where you can actually capture your like florals and things really nicely and it's a bit soft in the middle but you can see can you see this it's super cool i'm just gonna pop this one back and just wipe my hands on my apron because it's a, it's a little bit gooey consumer grade resin printers yes bioresins are equally as bad as pla do not buy into the greenwashing scam resin is plastic it doesn't matter how it's made, a resin will always be plastic. And as we know, bioresins, the majority of them are just made from 
non-renewable sources that you just can't you can't call a biomaterial but the problem is there's no authority there's no one that gives your product a stamp and says yes greenwashing exactly there's no one that stamps your product and says this is truly what it says it is there's no authority for that like last year at biosummit we came up with a kind of community phrase list you could say where we as people who make biomaterials came up and said this is what we want from a biomaterial this is how our community should act making biomaterials and this is what we want for the future of biomaterials and i actually have that document that i'll be happy to share with people if they want because as a community shouldn't we be educating people that making biomaterials is the way to go and what it is a biomaterial and how do we call out the greenwashing because as a community there's so much greenwashing but as a community there's also so many people taking each other's recipes and claiming them as their own to make a quick buck and not giving the right attribution. And, you know, that's what we talked about last year. There are some natural resins so you can get things like shellac, um, pigments that come or, or resins that come from animal based products. But the problem with them is how they're made. Yeah. And from trees. So pine, for example, how they're processed to get into a stage where they're usable isn't bio at all. And that's also the problem. Everything along the way needs to be as simple as possible. If it has more than five steps, it's not bio. And that is just what the UN defines as a biomaterial. I was really lucky to be able to go to that conference. Um, it was actually paid for by a grant that I got because again, I would never be able to get into that kind of thing because I'm not in academia, but I got a grant and was able to go and to sit there with some people who really know what they're doing and really want to know how can they change a the future of materials and education for materials too but in general you know tree resins are great but they're too sticky so you have to process them and break the the sticky components down but then it also means you need a lot of isopropyl alcohol when you're finished you know to clean down your products your work surfaces there's so many things that we really need to consider but again you have to consider, is it right to use a tree resin for this project? Should I even be touching a tree? Trees are so valuable. We heard from LaDonna earlier on about how valuable trees are. Should we even be touching trees? You know, should we be making sure that the trees we have, we keep intact so they grow strong and big for future generations to appreciate? There's so many questions that we don't ask about nature, but we just take nature for granted. I mean, I remember being told at Biosummit one time that doing science is a fundamental EU right or human right. It's in the Human Rights Act. But nature doesn't belong to any of us. But we have people in our community patenting nature. We have people in our bio community patenting mycelium, reishi mushrooms, for example. You know, you can't trademark the word reishi because it belongs to other people. You can't patent nature. It just doesn't work like that. So we really should think from a different perspective. And again, are we designing the disaster like here and now for the disaster, what we have, or are we designing the disaster, the thing that's coming in the future that we're going to create. And um, it's, it's a weird concept to have, but it's what I teach at KVK here in Copenhagen. Any more questions? And do you feel free to put your microphone on and talk too? I think everyone's going to sleep, maybe. I know it's late, it's like, what, maybe 10 here. Um, Benny PLA is, I think burning PLA is the best way to remove it from the soil. It's carbon neutral, but not, I, yeah, burning PLA is an interesting one because you are creating something when you burn the thing. So you're creating a secondary product, but then you have to figure out, is it easier to capture the carbon by burning it in a confined environment and then creating some kind of biochar, charcoal residue to use in another project? Or are you just gonna put it into the soil and it breaks down and becomes a microplastic and then try and figure out how you sieve out the microplastics from the soil? That's also a way you could look at things. 
Um, personally, when I do PLA products, I try and keep the PLA in a cycle <laughs> as much as I can because I don't want it to be burned. I don't want it to go into soil. I don't want it to go into water systems. So that's why, you know, I keep it in a box. I heat press it. I laser cut it. It gets made into decorations. It comes back to me. I shred it. I heat press it. It gets made into new sheets. I make the next project because I want to keep it going for as long as I can. Of course, the material properties are going to change over time, but I'd rather do that than send something to landfill knowing how much damage it's going to do. Yeah, Reextrude is a great um, precious plastics. If you've ever heard of the company, they're doing some amazing things with reextruding materials, especially plastic waste. Um, you know, we have people like the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. We have people doing really cool stuff with making alternative materials for printing purposes and for, you know, this kind of stuff. But again, we really need to rethink, is it, is it even worth doing? Should we be doing it? Everything has a reaction. Every action has a reaction, you know? And as making something that could potentially have an action or consequence, we really need to think about, I mean, at some point we all have to stop doing what we do if we want to survive. We just have to, and we have to rethink this whole process of materials and go back to complete basics. Look at history. Like the concept that I teach, so the steam and stem, but the concept that I teach is heat, which is history, engineering, art, technology, and science. Because when we look at history, we can actually learn so much from history. I mean, take now, for example, with COVID-19. If you look at Spanish flu, you can see the resemblance of certain things that we should do in society, but we, again, we don't look at history. We forget about history a lot of the time. If we look at the textiles, for example, we look at history. If we look at their natural materials, their natural dyes, their natural processing, using radiant urine to open up the structures of a textile, using rainwater instead of water from the tap. You know, things like bacterial dyes are great, but we need to advance on that. We need to start doing science in a huge open context and educating people that this is a reality. Making pigments from seaweed, you can have spectrums of green that can photosynthesize. We can do so much more with biology and science if we just start to really think out of the box and stop letting you know, 3D printers and rapid prototyping machines dictate what we should do because ultimately that's what we're doing. Well, that's what I feel that we're doing. Whether other people feel that way, that's a different question. But yeah, materials are great. I will um, do, I'm, I'm actually might even try and do a time lapse with these so you can actually see how it degrades or um, dries out. But it's, it's such a great material to work with, to be able to do, it's really simple. And you can add things to this like coffee grounds or flower petals or any, literally anything and experiments at home. So again, if you do want to reach out to me, you can find me on, find me on Slack. I am now Little Pink. I also have Facebook. I also have Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok, all the social media stuff, you know, try and be cool with the kids, um, <laughs> as, my, as my sister would say. But yeah, if you want to reach out to me, you can. And I do have more in-depth talk worksheets and things about Sergio economy, blue economy. Um, what is true Danish design, for example? Because Danish design is actually not Danish design at all. I mean, you can't call something Danish design if your material is made in China, the construction is done in Poland, and then it's you know just reassembled in Denmark. That's not Danish design. But unfortunately, that's what we're stuck with here in Denmark. Um, so yes, yeah, so you can reach out to me. I'm just going to do some final last questions because we have less than five minutes. So if you have anything to ask me, please do so. You, you can ask me like anything abstract and weird. I mean, this whole workshop's been pretty weird. <laughs> I mean, poor Fred, he's lost a leg. Um, what, what alternative filaments do I use for 3D printing? I use wax. I love using wax filaments. Um, I love using eggshell based filaments that I make, um, clay filament that I make. Um, wax is great. 
because you can make so many things. And then when you're done with the object, you can actually melt it back down and make candles and all of the, you know, weird stuff. I mean, here in Denmark, candles are a big thing. You know, we have this thing called hoogie. Most people have heard of it at some point. But, you know, if you can have a candle, it's hoogie. You know, from your, I don't know, maybe you've made a cup or something. Um, yeah, wax filament. Um, so which, do you wax filament? How is there a brand? Yes, so um, if you go onto a company, I actually will link it in the workshop channel, the company that I buy from. Highly recommend, um, I'm not sure if they ship worldwide, but if they don't look for the brand, they're really, really, really nice guys to deal with. I also have another one that's made out of um, wood. It's like a wood filament. Um, it's made from the waste material from CNC machines. So it's all gathered together, pulverized, and then made into a, a wood filament. So it's a secondary bypass process made into a filament. Super cool too. And you can actually sand it down and make into things. Um, so yeah. But if you have any more questions, you can reach out to me on social media, um, Slack, and I'll be bouncing around rooms and things over the next three days um, also. So if you see me. Do I have a 3D printer extruder? Not yet, Alex, but I have one in a different space in Copenhagen. So there's one actually out on AMA um, that my friends have where I can go and use any time. And they also have a precious plastic shredder. And then at another space where I am, there's also an extruder. So um, like a, a proper extruder for doing all kinds of plastic stuff. So there's two more minutes left. I just want to say thank you for kind of watching this weird, really weird train wreck thing. Yes, thank you guys for listening to me. I mean, poor Fred, he's poor guy. He got sacrificed for science, poor dude. But um, he's fine, he's growing me a new one. So I cannot really complain. He's a beautiful plant when he wants to grow properly. So yeah, so if you want to reach out to me, um, again, social media, Slack. Um, if you find a recipe on the internet and you're not sure what it could be or how it's made, again, just ask me. I didn't really pull them all off, so I'm just going to pull them a little more now. Um, yeah, you can just ask me, like, hey now, what do you think of this? Or hey now, how does this work? Um, nine times out of ten I probably know and I probably know the source of where that recipe came from because again not everyone gives attribution where it's really coming from. No I'm not giving any talks uh, this year. I did one by Summit 2. Jesus I feel old now. Uh, <laughs> by Summit 2 I did a talk about how sustainable is your lab and how we will make labs sustainable and then last year of course I was a bio fellow so um, this year I'm not doing any talks. This is the only talk and workshop I'm doing. But of course we can continue this talk on Slack, on Mingler, if people want to use Mingler. I've tried using Mingler recently, but um, it doesn't seem to want to work properly, but we'll see. So yeah, it's, um, it's been super nice having you guys here and hopefully you've learned something interesting and different and just make a material. It doesn't matter if you fail. All my failures are my best successes. That's all I can say. All right, thank you so much, Nell. That, that was a great way to wrap this whole workshop up. Uh, so no quick snaps problem. for Nell, quick snaps. And, and for Fred, of course, poor Fred. Um, poor Fred, I mean. So before everybody leaves, if we can take a quick family photo. So if you can turn on your cameras just for yeah. five seconds, uh, smile for the camera, wave, and, and then I'll let you be on your way. So. Let's see who's going to join us. Okay, ready? Okay, ready? One, two, cheese.